Um, all right, let's um, go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first meeting of the Texas Mindset Initiative for 2022, New Year. Um, it is a, a real honor to have today's speaker. Um, uh, Dr. Cherian is a, someone who is, has been a leader in the field um, has trained many of the greatest scientists in this field and has done some of the highest impact work. Um, and so uh, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, her talk for us today. Um, for those of you who are joining and uh, don't know about the Texas Mindset Initiative, let me tell you a couple things very briefly. Uh, the Texas Mindset Initiative is devoted to uh, work that uh, tries to broaden representation in uh, especially in um, large introductory uh, intro courses uh, to widen the pipeline um, into science and uh, advanced fields. Um, it was started initially by a seed grant from the College of Natural Science and uh, supported and stewarded by our new Dean, David Vandenbout. Um, also, uh, we were supported by the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts uh, in the College of Education. Um, the Texas Mindset Initiative uh, works to uh, develop faculty training programs and support programs in the form of fellowships for faculty, but we also host a speaker series like this one. And our hope is really just to have a continued dialogue and conversation about the barriers to representation that arise in our large introductory courses, and that might be amenable to systemic efforts and changes uh, to the cultures of our universities and our classes. And with that in mind, um, it's just a delight to have uh, really one of the world's most renowned behavioral scientists presenting her research to us today. Um, uh, so uh, Sapna is a professor uh, at the University of Washington, did her PhD at Stanford University. Um, and uh, Sapna, uh, I speak for everyone here to say how delighted we are to see your talk. So uh, you can take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for those um, overly generous and kind words. Um, I'm really honored to be here with all of you today. I have uh, attended, uh, I think, all of these this year and um, really enjoyed getting to hear about all the varied work that's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me here today. Um, let me go ahead and get started here with my slides. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, what explains the persistent underrepresentation of women in computer science and engineering. And um, I'm really drawing on um, two decades of research that I've been doing on this problem. So I'm going to give you both the kind of uh, high level view of how I think about this problem, but also get into some specifics on um, recent studies that we've been doing. And um, I'm happy to take questions during today. I also have, we'll have time at the end for questions. So however you want to do it is totally fine with me. Um, so I'm going to take you back to tw 20 years ago, a little bit more than that, of when I started getting interested in this problem and the types of papers that I was coming across in social psychology on um, women's underrepresentation and underperformance. And um, they were a lot of the seminal papers in the field, um, things about stereotype threat and women's underperformance in math and um, uh, self-concepts in math and underrepresentation of women in science. And these are really, really important papers, but they didn't completely gel with my own experience as a high school student and a college student in the 1990s. And the reason for that was because when I looked around my science and math classes, what I actually saw was a lot of women and girls in those classes and a lot of them doing quite well, um, sometimes actually outperforming the boys on their tests. And what I saw looked something more like this, and these are the national data for um, uh, the proportion of, of college degrees that are granted to women in these various STEM fields. Um, when I was thinking about my biology classes and my math classes and my chemistry classes, I was seeing fairly gender balanced classes, sometimes in some cases like with biology, um, life sciences, even more women and girls in those classes. Um, but it was really when I looked at other fields that were becoming increasingly important and influential in our society, fields like computer science and engineering, uh, where I really saw the underrepresentation. And um, it formed a kind of puzzle to me, like why would fields like biology, chemistry, and math be more gender balanced than fields like computer science, engineering, and physics? 
And now before I get into trying to answer that question, let me just um, tell you for a minute or two or like really 30 seconds why we should even care about computer science and engineering. So um, it's probably obvious to you at this point, but computer scientists and engineers um, are in charge of so much of our lives from things like what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, how we interact with each other, how we interface with each other um, in, in our relationships, but also um, if we think about the future of healthcare, of education, of politics, I mean, these all these really, really important domains have been uh, very much shaped by the, the types of products and services that computer scientists and engineers are designing. Um, these are also highly lucrative fields, and um, if we really want to close the gender gap in uh, salary, we need to think about getting women into the fields that pay the most, fields like computer science and engineering. So we really want everybody at the table in terms of designing products and services in computer science and engineering. Um, it hasn't happened yet. These fields are still currently only graduating about 20% um, of their degrees go to women. Um, and so the question is, is why is this? And I'm going to start with an explanation that um, I hear quite a bit. Um, I'm going to uh, read it to you in terms of a quote that a computer science professor said, uh, the real explanation is obvious. Women are less drawn to science and engineering than men are. They must be choosing not to enter, presumably because they don't want to, presumably because they, by and large, don't like these fields. So if we had to boil this down to a single sentence, it's this argument. Girls are not going into these fields because they are less interested. They're less interested in computer science engineering. They're more interested in other fields. Um, what I'm gonna suggest today is that this explanation is problematic, that we could find evidence to support this explanation that women and girls are less interested in computer science and engineering as these fields are today. But if we end there, if we use that as our explanation for why women are underrepresented, um, we, uh, we end up creating and amplifying these very gender disparities. So this explanation is, is, um, should be uh, always accompanied by a more broader perspective on what's going on in the social context of these fields. So today what I'm going to talk about is the first giving you some evidence for why we shouldn't end the explanation with interests, with women are just less interested in these fields. So why is it dangerous to talk about women and girls being less interested? And then I'm going to go on and, and tell you, well, if, it, we don't, if that's not the full explanation, what is the full explanation? What might be the more accurate view of explaining these gender disparities in computer science and engineering? Um, so the first part is looking at some recent work that we did, actually just published, I think, two months ago, um, on uh, why it might be dangerous to explain disparities by pointing to uh, girls' and women's interests compared to boys' interests. And um, this is work that I've done with uh, two longtime collaborators, um, Dr. Alison Master, who is a assistant professor of education at the University of Houston um, and a former postdoc at the University of Washington, and also um, Andy Meltzoff, who is a developmental psychologist at the University of Washington. And um, this uh, idea, this kind of sentiment that I shared with you at the beginning, this idea that girls are less interested than boys in computer science and engineering, when I heard that, and when we were when Allison and I were talking about it, we realized that it really struck us as a classic stereotype. It was a generalized belief about a particular category, girls and boys, and it was an assumption that would be uh, that's applied to the group and applied to individuals within that group. Individual girls might be less interested in um, computer science and engineering than individual boys. Now, um, we started to think about, when we started to think about that sentiment as a stereotype, it led to this question of, could this stereotype, once it's out there, actually predict and cause gender disparities in computer science and engineering? So that's the question that we set out to test. We also had a secondary question. Um, so there's been a lot of work when we think about gender disparities in STEM, looking at a uh, different type of stereotype, and that is something that we're calling here a gender ability stereotype. So that's the idea that girls might be less good than boys at computer science and engineering. Um, and this is, of course, also a stereotype, um, but it's a different one. It has to do with ability as opposed to what people are interested in. And this stereotype has been um, pretty well studied uh, over um, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of papers. And um, what, the, what people have shown is that when this stereotype is salient, women tend to underperform. And some papers have also shown that they express less interest in fields like math and computer science when uh, the gender ability stereotype is salient. Um, so what we wanted to do was compare these two stereotypes to each other and see whether they predicted and caused gender disparities and interests in computer science and engineering. 
Um, so I'm going to describe four studies to you in this paper. I'm going to lump together studies one and two and then lump together studies three and four because those two studies were very similar to each other in methods. Um, and this uh, first couple studies were um, derived um, or um, conducted in partnership with uh, the Department of Education at Rhode Island. So Allison formed a really amazing collaboration with them. And um, they were starting on an initiative called Computer Science for Rhode Island, where they were going to be exposing all of their children in public schools to computer science, starting at the youngest ages in elementary school and going all the way through high school. And as part of this initiative, they wanted to collect data on what the attitudes were of their um, students across the um, across the ages. And um, so in study one, we were able to collect data from uh, 733 students in third through seventh grade. And this was in a, one of the school districts in Rhode Island that was suburban, uh, mostly upper middle class, mostly white. And then Allison asked for a more diverse school district, and um, they granted us uh, access to two other school districts that were more diverse. So this time it was um, study four had uh, sorry study two had 1,544 um, students, and um, it was a much more both racially and socioeconomically diverse uh, uh, set of students in these school districts. And what we wanted to do in this initial study was measure, assess this gender interest stereotype. Um, compare it to gender ability stereotypes and see what these stereotypes predicted. So the way we assessed gender interest stereotypes among these um, pretty young children starting in first grade was um, by questions that asked them to agree or disagree with how much they think that boys like coding and girls like coding. And the word coding was used um, because that was the district's language. And we worked with the district to come up with language for both um, computer science and engineering that fit with the way that the individual districts and schools were using it. Um, so coding was the most common way we asked it, but we also sometimes asked about computing and other, and other um, things, depending on the way that the students had been hearing about it in the schools. Um, we used a different score. So the more that um, the higher, the gender interest stereotype, the more that students believe that boys like coding more than girls like coding, so that gender interest stereotype favored boys. Um, we also asked about engineering in study two, and we asked about these gender ability stereotypes with just replacing like with good at, and um, asking both about coding uh, in both studies and then engineering in study two. Uh, for a dependent measure, we wanted to see whether it predicts students' actual interests in these fields. So we asked a couple of questions about how much they like to do computer science, coding, um, engineering activities. And then we also um, were curious about whether these stereotypes had a, um, pr a predicted sense of lower sense of belonging. So uh, we asked sense of belonging items as well. And here are, um, here's the first figure I'm going to show you, it is a assessment of how much students in study one and study two endorsed these gender interest stereotypes. And the higher the bars, the more that they endorsed that these gender interest stereotypes favored boys. So they believe that boys liked coding, for example, more than girls like coding. Um, and in study one, oh, and I separated it by girls and boys. So you can see boy, what boys think and what girls think. Um, oh, let me actually take this um, opportunity to say one thing about gender, which is that um, throughout all these studies and the, what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to be talking, comparing girls to boys and men to women, but um, we all know gender is not binary and, um, and uh, you know, there's more than two categories. Um, for the purposes of today, I'll be talking about boys and girls, but of course, it's really important that we also investigate the um, outcomes of non-binary people uh, as it relates to um, computer science and engineering. Um, so uh, coming back to study one results, what you see here is if you average across girls and boys, you do see a gender interest stereotype in study one where um, both, you know, but that but students endorsed this gender interest stereotype favoring boys over um, the over one favoring girls. So they generally think boys are more interested in coding than girls are. Um, this is a stronger effect for boys than girls, and we'll see that across all the, all the different ways that the stereotype is assessed in, in the two studies and across computer science and engineering. Boys tend to endorse this more than girls do. Here are the study two results. So um, in this case, an even stronger stereotype in study two. Um, we think one reason that it could be stronger is because we had a wider range of ages, and you see that endorsement uh, is actually um, 
uh, stronger among older children than younger children. So what you see is in study two, boys endorse this uh, stereotype more than girls again, and overall they endorse the stereotype that boys are more interested than girls in both coding and engineering. Um, one nice thing that we could do with study two is because we had a diverse sample, we can dig a little deeper and we can um, disaggregate by race, racial group and gender. So I'll show you those data. So this is breaking down um, the coding results, the coding stereotypes by the different racial groups that we had in our sample that were large enough to be able to test. And um, what you see here is uh, first an overall across the board, when you even break it down by race and gender, all groups endorse this stereotype that boys are more interested than girls are in coding. But you also see this interesting possible pattern here where the gender difference, the fact that boys are endorsing it more than girls that we saw before, that might be um, attenuated in some racial groups. And I think it would be really interesting to try to follow up on that and, and see if that pattern holds with other data and um, try to figure out what the reasons for that are. But, um, but anyway, but pretty interesting. Um, I'll also show you the same graph for uh, engineering and you see a similar pattern here, stronger stereotypes. Um, everybody has these stereotypes when you disaggregate by race and gender, all the different um, race gender combinations that we were able to test endorse the stereotype that boys are more interested in engineering. Um, and again, you see some slightly different patterns across racial groups suggesting that disaggregating this way could be useful to try to understand why um, sometimes boys seem to endorse these more strongly and sometimes maybe they don't. Um, the next I'm gonna show you is what happens when we compare interest stereotypes to these ability stereotypes. So looking at girls are interested versus uh, girls are less interested versus girls are less good. And um, these are the same bars I showed you before, but just collapsed across gender. So, you know, across the board, there are these gender interest stereotypes. Gender ability stereotypes are weaker in study one, they did not show up. So boys and girls, um, you know, students were based were in were not uh, saying that boys were better at computer science. Um, they were showing up in study uh, two with computer science and engineering where they were endorsing that um, that boys were better at computer science, but in all three studies, the interest stereotypes were endorsed more strongly. So students were more willing to report that girls were um, less interested in computer science and engineering than that they were less good at computer science and engineering. Uh, looking at uh, what these stereotypes predict, so interest stereotypes did predict girls lower interest in computer science and engineering, so the more that an individual girl believed that girls were less interested, the less interest she expressed in computer science and engineering. Um, this relationship holds when controlling for gender ability stereotypes, and when you compare the strength of the relationship, interest stereotypes are a stronger predictor of girls lower interest than these ability stereotypes. And um, interest stereotypes also appear to be endorsed at an earlier age. Um, they were endorsed starting around third grade, whereas ability stereotypes were endorsed starting around sixth grade. Um, so taken together, we start to get some sense so that these that students seem to endorse these interest stereotypes um, and that they might predict negative consequences for girls. Uh, but of course, this is all correlational data. I'm going to show you um, one more piece of uh, correlational evidence here, that sense of belonging may be um, a mechanism. Uh, so gender interest stereotypes predict lower sense of belonging. This is among girls, all these data that I um, graphed here are among girls, and that um, in turn predicts lower interest in computer science. Now, um, this is, you can't, we can't make a causal claim for this because these are all cross-sectional correlational data, but I'll come back to this. Uh, studies three and four are experimental to try to, try to tease apart um, what direction these relationships go in. Um, so what we see is that gender interest stereotypes are endorsed across a range of ages and across gender race intersections, and they seem to predict girls' own interest in computer science and engineering. Um, but like I said, we need experiments to really know whether these interests, these stereotypes are causing girls to have lower interests. So that's what we turn to next. Um, we did two controlled laboratory experiments to establish causality. Uh, the first study was with 58 to nine year old girls. We chose that age because um, like I mentioned previously, third grade is around where we see these stereotypes um, becoming uh, endorsed across the board for computer science and engineering. So um, this seemed like a, a good age to try to intervene. Um, so we had uh, 
in the in study three, we had girls brought into the laboratory. So this was done before COVID, and this was done in Seattle. So the um, racial breakdown reflects the um, racial representation in our Seattle uh, kids subject pool. And then study four was run during COVID. Um, Allison adapted all the methods to be on Zoom, and uh, we had 122 children. And this time, we included both boys and girls. And um, again, racial demographics reflected the Seattle um, subject pool that we have. Um, and what we did in this study is um, we had our uh, children learn about two activities. In study four, we actually made them computer science activities to see how these stereotypes affected interest in computer science. Um, so we called them searching activities and reducing activities and um, related them to computer science. In study three, we made them novel activities. So they were called triangle and rectangular activities. And the reason we wanted to go with novel activities is because um, we wanted to make sure that this stereotype was uh, had an effect, even if, if uh, children didn't know anything about computer science or gender disparities beforehand. And our logic for this is that someone could say, well, but it's the stereotype is technically true. Girls are less interested in computer science than boys are, for example. And so maybe uh, because it's true, it's just not that harmful. Um, and what we wanted to show is that even when the stereotype has no basis in reality, it can uh, create and perpetuate disparities. So we did it with novel activities as well. So this is a picture of what, of what study four looked like. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of Zoom. Um, our experimenter would hold up two activities, the surging activity and the reducing activity, and um, ask the participant which one they would rather um, they would rather do. And before asking them that question, the experimenter would give them a little bit of information about the activities. And one of the things they would say is for one activity, girls are much less interested in this activity than our boys. And in the other activity, girls and boys are equally interested. And um, everything was counterbalanced, meaning that sometimes the reducing activity was the one with the, with the interest stereotype, sometimes the searching activity was, um, sometimes the searching activity came first, sometimes second. So we made sure all of those things were balanced with each other. And um, what we did is uh, asked the child which one they would want to um, either take home if it was an in-person study or they would like email to their parents so that they could um, then do that activity at home. Then we also asked them how interested they were in doing each of those activities. Um, so for study three, the study with just girls, um, this is a um, pie chart that shows the proportion of girls that wanted to take home or do the um, activity when it had a gender interest stereotype versus no stereotype. And what you can see is that when girls thought that the activity um, had a gender interest stereotype, that girls were less interested than boys, they were significantly not interested in that activity. They were uh, much more likely to choose the activity that did not have a gender interest stereotype. Um, and then uh, study four, uh, we saw a similar pattern here, a little bit less strong, but um, still significant where girls are uh, avoiding that activity that had the gender interest stereotype and, and choosing the activity that didn't. Um, and with boys, we see no preference. So the stereotype didn't seem to necessarily be attracting them. Um, I'll also show you the continuous measures of interest. Uh, for girls, what you see is a uh, difference here where um, girls are less interested in the activity with the gender interest stereotype, both in studies three and four. And boys, when they're asked about it, they don't seem to have a strong preference uh, between the two. Um, I will say that some of you might be wondering whether we ever tried the third condition, which would be boys are uh, less interested than girls. And we did try that. Actually, we have a, a study in the supplement. And what we end up seeing is that boys in that study look a lot like girls in this study. So when they find out that their gender is not really interested in a certain activity, they don't choose that activity either. So we don't think it's something about like girls being particularly sensitive or anything like that. It's that that we're giving them um, the information that, you know, when when you hear that people of your group are not interested in something, um, you might draw the conclusion that based on that information, maybe you, you won't be interested in it either. Okay, um, and then we get a little bit closer with um, our mech with the establishing cause here, although you know it's still um, it's still measured uh, cross sectionally sense of belonging, but we do see that gender interest stereotypes uh, cause a reduced sense of belonging among girls than um, the activities without stereotypes, and that um, does predict their lower interest in that activity. 
So what we see is that gender to stereotypes favoring boys cause less interest in girls, but don't seem to do that um, in boys when the stereotype favors boys. And we see this effect across both novel and computer science activities. And it seems to be mediated by girls' lower sense of belonging, although we would need a lot more research and um, other alternative explanations and some experimental um, manipulation to establish sense of belonging as the, um, as the you know, as, as, a, as a real mechanism. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take a pause there. If anybody has any questions now, I'm happy to take them or I can also uh, go on to the kind of how do we think about gender disparities if we should you know, not necessarily talk about interests. Yes, Christina. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, Christina Market from Physics. And I just want to make the comment, um, I really like the study that you did, because when I always raised the question, there are not so many women in physics, I was told exactly what you said, oh, they're not interested in that. I mean, and it really bothered me always so much because it was a statement about, I don't care why you are not so, why there are not so many women. And I felt always with that statement really excluded because mm -hmm. nobody want to look into it why it's maybe so difficult and that kind of means for me was always just don't ask this question don't bother and it was kind of like always i received it as a rejection instead of someone asking you so how was your life being as a woman is there anything that we can do to improve it yeah it's kind of just flat out I don't want to go there. We are just yeah. not interested. And I, I really like that you go further into it. I just want to make the comment. It totally resonates with me, kind of. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a really um, helpful comment. I totally agree. I think it's a way to shut down. Um, it's a it puts the blame on women and girls for not being interested. Like, oh, they need to change, or you know, it's up to them. And it it takes the focus off the fields and what the fields could be doing to actually. Uh, increase, you know, women's uh, feeling that they want to be in these fields. Um, so yes, I think that's right. And um, that's, that's my message for today. Let's not stop the conversation at women are less interested. Let's, let's ask, why are women less interested? And is there anything you could do to possibly change that? Um, so thank you. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Um, let's see, I, I th Amit, I see your hand, but I thought I saw another hand that came up before you, but I'm, I'm in that weird mode where I can't see everybody. So I'm just gonna let whoever wants to go next, go ahead. Uh, did, I'll go before David, I guess. Uh, okay. the, um, super interesting. I was curious about for these experiments three and four, um, what your prediction would be if you added uh, conditions that were sort of um, stereotyped ability conditions in addition to stereotype interest conditions, sort of the magnitude of those effects, or even if you crossed stereotyped interest with stereotyped ability, is the prediction for an interaction like does does that amplify these sorts of effects um i'm just curious about your thoughts yeah there. that's a great question i would have to think more so the interaction i would have to think more about the interaction of the two um i can say that um i think one thing that we one thing that we've um seen sometimes with stereotype threat is uh sometimes people want to prove it wrong you know so like if they hear girls are less good at this and then they feel like, oh, okay, you know, so I think stereotype threat can go either way. If the task is very hard, then, and you, if, if you put in a gender ability stereotype, then, you know, women and girls will underperform. But if the task is very easy, like you're making a choice, um, I think that's a little bit more complicated because we have seen, like, I, I know um, Chris Crandall has a paper about like, you just want to like prove it wrong. So you, you kind of try harder and you just pick the thing, you know, um, that, that people think you can't do. Um, and we did see that a little bit um, sometimes with our study too, with interest, like there's, we have actually, um, Allison was on Good Morning America and there was uh, one girl that they profiled who, who didn't, um, uh, you know, who picked the, the, the activity with the stereotype, with the gender interest stereotype. And she's like, girls can do anything, you know? And so she was, but I don't think that's as common with gender interest stereotypes as it would be with like, I think you can't do this. Oh, I'm going to show you that I can, you know? Um, and uh, so anyway, so I think that one could go either way with gender ability stereotypes because we don't have like a very difficult performance related task. It's a choice of what activity do you want to take home? And I think those motivation to disprove might at times outweigh that um, cognitive load that stereotype threat puts on you. So I think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I haven't thought about the two interacting, but it seems like when both stereotypes are present, that can't be good. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it at, leave it at that. 
Um, David. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm curious to your reflections about the motivated reasons why people like the interest-based stereotype. Um, like presumably it's something like it, it feels wrong to say that women aren't smart enough to be in computer science. And we've learned that that's not an okay thing to say, mm -hmm. but if we say that they're just not interested, then it feels like a personal choice. That's right. And therefore I, I, as someone who's in a field, don't have any like responsibility for your personal choices and it's up to you. You know, yeah. I'm just kind of curious if that's the, the kind of underlying psychology of why people might be motivated to make interspace explanations and, then I guess if that's true, then is it a challenge to then get people who are decision makers to question those interest-based um, stereotypes and, and attributions and make them feel more like something we could control? So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious if that's how you're thinking. Yeah, that's exactly how I'm thinking about it. You know, um, I think people, I think the norms are stronger against expressing gender uh, ability stereotypes. I actually would love to study this. It was, I had pulled my future direction slide out of this talk, but that was one of them, like studying the norms of um, how much people are, you know, think that they, it would be okay to say that girls are worse versus girls are less interested. And I think the norms are a lot weaker with um, uh, a lot stronger, um, you know, to not say girls are less um, uh, good at something. And, um, yeah. And I, the way I see it is like, you know, we had this, um, at university of Washington, we had this, uh, this, um, he, he teaches, he teaches our intro computer science class and he posted a blog post on, um, ba basically this, you know, like what Christina was saying, um, basically, you know, we will never be able to make, uh, reach gender parity in computer science because, um, women will just never be interested in this field. It was this very like reductionistic and he made sure to caveat, I'm not saying that women can't do it. Women are just as good programmers as men, but they don't want to do it and we shouldn't force them to do it. So, and I, so I think that this is like the new way of talking about, uh, you know, you can't say, people think they can't say anymore that women are less good at something, but I think the idea of saying women are less interested, maybe because it's wrapped up in, as you were saying, David, like this kind of American notion that um, we all have free choice and we're all, you know, we can all um, make these choices independently and that there's no constraints on our choices, that um, interests are an okay thing to talk about. And, you know, we're very focused um, in our culture on what people are interested in and um, always asking kids what they want to do when they grow up and things like that. So it, it becomes like a more acceptable way of perpetuating, I think, these kind of harmful notions that, of, you know, who, who can be in these fields and who can't. But yeah, that's exactly what, how I'm thinking about it. I, I think I want to study the differences in norms. Um, and uh, and then I, I'm, if anybody has feedback, I don't know what to do with that exactly. Like, it, I guess one intervention is telling people about this, you know, work that it's, it's doing harm, but, um, and then I think maybe the other thing is also figuring out, is there a way to talk about interests that is less harmful? Um, maybe saying, you know, in the same way that stereotype threat has looked at, if you point to structural causes that can be less harmful. I think that's another, you know, future direction that something else is working on now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it would be really interesting to try to show that this is a motivated um, kind of response to feeling like you can't say certain things. Um, and so you can shut down the conversation by saying something that's more seemingly more socially acceptable, but still very problematic. Thanks. Um, Greg, I think you were next. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm a professor in the computer science department. And if I recall from one of your slides, your earlier slides there, it showed that the disparity, if you will, between or in the Latinx and the Asian community or individuals was much smaller than it was with black and white uh, mm -hmm. communities. And also I'm just looking at my class, I'm teaching a grad level course in computer security. Mm -hmm. And I look at the number of American women in the class and the percentage is exceedingly low. Mm -hmm. But I take a look at some of, you know, take a look at the non-US citizens, most of them coming from either China or from um, uh, India. Uh, the percentage of women is much greater. Um, so I was wondering, you know, where, how does, or where did, uh, did you look at cultural um, mm -hmm. factors that might impact the interest of girls and then women in these fields? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that in this talk, except to answer your question. Uh, uh, but we have done some, um, we, we published a review paper in 2017 in um, a journal called Psych Bulletin, where we, uh, we spent some time looking at um, culture. And you're right, what you're observing is um, consistent with what the data show. So if you, it's actually really interesting. If you disaggregate by race and gender and you look at who's getting degrees in computer science, engineering, and physics, you see that the largest gender disparities within any racial group are within um, white Americans. So there's a bigger underrepresentation of white women compared to white men than there is of like black women compared to black men, Latinx women compared to Latin Asian women compared to Asian men. Um, and so that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean that like, uh, you know, we have enough black women and Asian women and, you know, it's um, the numbers are still much smaller, but if you look at it as a proportion, what you see is there's something um, that's the disparities are bigger among uh, white students than they are among the other groups. And um, there could be multiple reasons for this. Um, part of it could be who's in college. Um, but I think, like you were pointing to, the cultural factors are really important. And this kind of goes back to the previous question a little bit, because I started to you know, talk about how in um, American culture, like white American culture, there's really this focus on you should do what you love. You should follow your passions. We actually have a paper under review about this right now. So I'm happy to send that out if people are interested. Um, and uh, it's really about you digging deep, figuring out what you're interested in, and then pursuing that thing. But if you live in a society that's very gendered, like ours, where girls are socialized to have different interests than boys are, then looking inward to your interests is going to exacerbate this gender disparity. Um, but if you go to cultures where, you know, your interests are part of it, but not, you know, not everything, you should also think about supporting your family, you know, doing things that are practical, get being able to support yourself, you know, and so those um, motivations can decrease gender disparities because they kind of put everybody on the same page. Um, so I think that's one part of it. The other cultural element I'll talk about is that, and I'll get into this a little bit, uh, well, I'll talk about the American side of it in the next part of the talk, but that is um, about what these stereotypes are like, uh, what it means to be a computer scientist in the US versus what it means to be a computer scientist in other parts of the world. And you see in a lot of countries, um, uh, outside the US, especially ones outside of Western Europe as well, um, countries like Malaysia um, and uh, some countries in Africa um, and uh, Eastern Europe, that uh, gender disparities are much smaller in computer science and engineering. And a part of it has to do with computer science being seen as an appropriate career for women. It's seen as kind of a, um, you know, a career where you're inside, you're in working indoors on like some of the engineering careers where you have to be outside in the field. Um, it's, uh, you know, seen as a, a, a kind of flexible job. Um, so um, it's not seen as kind of this, um, as I'll talk about later, this like you needed to have dropped out of college and be a white guy in a hoodie who likes sci-fi, you know, th those stereotypes are, are not strong there in a lot of those um, countries as they are here. So the image of what it means to be a computer scientist is very different. And I think that plays a big role in a lot of these um, other countries in getting people to put computer science on the table. Um, so yeah, so there are, I think there's a lot of cultural elements. Um, the, I'll recommend a sociologist named Maria Charles, who uh, really did some initial work on this, looking at um, gender disparities in aspirations across different countries. And um, she's continued to do some excellent work. So she actually has like um, really interesting sociological data looking across countries and, uh, you know, kind of you can go down the list and see which countries have bigger gender disparities. And even though country, you know, countries like the US, we have a lot of resources, a lot of opportunity. Turns out the more resources, the more opportunity, the, the um, bigger the gender disparities, which is a really interesting um, puzzle that a lot of people are trying to solve. And so I think some of the explanations that I pointed to are some of the things that sociologists and psychologists are talking about. Yeah, great question. Chris. Hey, Subna. So I was going to comment about something else, which I can do in a second. But what you just said reminded me of an experience you and I had when we went to that Grace Hopper conference for women yeah. in engineering. And uh, we were doing a study of, of women's female identity, uh, women in engineering and their female identities. And you remember that there was this 
Russian, female Russian computer scientist who, I, for me, it was the first time I this idea ever came up. She said, it's so funny where I'm from, um, computer science isn't uh, stereotyped as masculine. If, in fact, if anything, it's stereotyped as kind of feminine because it's not physically demanding and all that. And um, it, it just, you already made this point and using much better empirical basis than an anecdote from one Russian woman at a conference, but that highlighted for me that it cultures where the stereotype isn't um doesn't uh block women from wanting to be a part of the field don't have to be more egalitarian cultures right they can be right. plenty chauvinistic and it's just that they're chauvinistic in a different way mm -hmm. that's right yeah yeah that's what the data shows so um the more women are, that are in the labor market in a certain country the greater the gender disparities in computer science engineering. So a lot of the countries that have more women in computer science and engineering are also countries that don't necessarily score high on, on indexes of gender equality. So um, so anyway, so it's, it's a really interesting, um, yeah, and I forgot about that person, but yeah, that was, that's, uh, that's interesting and, you know, where so much of this stuff started. So thanks for the throwback nostalgia memory. <laughs> um, on David's question, I was just gonna add really quickly, I think, that the, the idea of the, the interest stereotype as a fallback for people who might have started off with an ability stereotype and realized it wasn't acceptable. Mm -hmm. I actually think that falls into a much broader pattern of people making up empirical just so stories to support the belief they want to have, right? So people say, oh, racial inequality is about genetics. And so there's nothing we can do about it. So let's stop worrying about it or it's not about one group being fundamentally inferior, it's a culture of poverty, right? It's like, we yeah. make up these, if it, if, it, if it favors our side for it to be a choice, then we make it a choice. And if it favors our side for it to not be a choice, like, right, like homosexuality is another case, then we make up a just so story. And I, I think that it falls into a larger rhetorical pattern. In that yeah, way. that's super interesting. Yeah, so thinking about broadening um, from just thinking about gender interest, gender ability stereotypes to kind of, when do we use the rhetoric of choice um, to kind of justify inequalities? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. We should work on that. <laughs> um, great, any other questions before I go on? Okay, thank you. Those were really excellent questions. Um, so feel free to keep them coming. Okay, so here I'm gonna be um, kind of t telling you you know, after doing 20 years of work on this, how I think about gender disparities now. And um, this is work I've done with so many people, I could not put all their pictures on this slide, uh, but I put some of my um, advisors on this slide who uh, helped me think about these ideas. And then um, a couple of former students who have published multiple papers with me on um, these. And then there's so many others who've been doing such excellent work, uh, helping trying to understand how to think about gender disparities in these fields. And, um, you know, I think one thing to know is if anybody says, you know, the reason for gender disparities is this, <laughs> and they point to one thing, they are almost certainly wrong because um, the reason for gender disparities is complex and multiply determined. And I'm just putting up a few reasons here that have empirical support. So there's still lingering discrimination in fields like computer science engineering and many, many other fields as well. Um, you know, discrimination in the form of sending, if you send out resumes and you, keep everything the same and you change the name from a man's name to a woman's name. You see that women are deemed less competent, less likely to be hired for jobs in science labs. Um, there's still um, sexual harassment is still a major problem in a lot of these fields. Um, in addition to that, we just talked about how stereotypes can contribute to underrepresentation. So both interest stereotypes, also ability stereotypes. Um, women are, and girls are still socialized away from these fields. And there's also, because women are underrepresented in these fields, there's um, the, not the same level of role modeling that there would be if they were more represented. So these are just a, some, there's obviously many more um, that I could list here as well. But one of the things that always interested me about these explanations was that you could have applied these explanations to fields like biology and math before that they uh, became more gender balanced. And they managed to become more gender balanced even as computer science, engineering and physics stayed so male dominated. So what is it about computer science, engineering and physics that makes it so different from um, biology, math and chemistry? 
Um, and I have a longer answer to this question. Um, there's a few things that are going on, including what's going on with K through 12 educational policy, like which classes are taught in high schools. Um, and I'm happy to get into that more in Q&A if you want. But what I'm going to do right now is focus on um, the cultural side of it. So what is it about computer science, engineering, and phys physics cultures that might be different? And I'm going to focus on one aspect of these cultures, um, something that we term masculine defaults. Um, so we define masculine defaults as a form of bias in which characteristics and behaviors associated with the male gender role are valued, rewarded, or seen as standard or necessary in a certain environment. Um, and what we think is that fields like computer science, engineering, and physics have more intense or more masculine defaults than fields like biology um, and, uh, and chemistry and math. Now, let me uh, take a minute here and talk about what I mean by gender roles, because since that's part of the definition. So in our society, we have two primary gender roles, the male gender role and the female gender role. And as we talked about before, um, this doesn't mean we have two genders. Gender is not binary. But that's one of the problems with gender roles is that it reduces people to either the male or the female gender role. And then it prescribes certain behaviors as um, sanctioned for each gender role. So men in our society are expected to do things like self-promote, be self-reliant, assertive, independent, competitive, confident, et cetera. And women in our society are expected to do things like the other promoting, nurturing, agreeable, interdependent, collaborative, modest, adjusting, et cetera. And when the traits and characteristics associated with the things on the left, with the male gender role, when they're valued and rewarded or seen as normal or standard in an environment, those environments may make it more challenging for women to enter and be successful. Um, so why uh, would those environments make be challenging for women? Uh, so there's really three reasons. So first of all, because women are not socialized to engage um, in some of these stereotypically masculine behaviors, they may be relatively rarer in many women than many men. An example of this is self-promotion. Um, when um, Google uh, looked at their data of who was getting promoted a few years ago. Their men were getting promoted at a faster rate than women, even when they were equally qualified. And in digging some more, what they realized is that it was because they had a self-nomination for promotion system where you had to express that you were ready to get promoted. And um, what we know from the research is that women are often less likely to self-promote than men are because they're not socialized to self-promote and because they may receive negative feedback when they do self-promote. So when you have an environment that values something like self-promotion or rewards it in the form of promotion, um, you are gonna disadvantage um, women most likely. Second, even when women have these stereotypically masculine characteristics to the same extent as men do, they may not be recognized for having them. So we can point back to the resume studies when women's resumes were equally scientifically competent as men's resumes, their competence was not recognized. They were still judged to be less competent than men. And third, even when women are recognized for having stereotypically masculine characteristics, they may still be disadvantaged because they can encounter backlash. They can encounter social and economic sanctions for um, fitting the male gender role and for violating the female gender role. And this is especially likely when women engage in dominance type behaviors like assertiveness. Um, so one of the things that we thought was important to do with this paper was distinguish the idea of masculine defaults from the traditional way that we often think about discrimination and bias as differential treatment, the mistreatment or negative treatment of women compared to men. So this includes being judged as less competent, being harassed, not getting promoted. Um, anytime that there's a door that's open to a man that's closed to a woman, this would be differential treatment. Now, masculine defaults differs because women and men can be treated identically in a certain environment. But the, um, so the door could be open to both, but the environment is set up in such a way that makes it easier for men to enter and to be successful. Um, so it's really important to distinguish these two um, because the interventions that you need for one um, are not necessarily interventions you need for the other. And in fact, the interventions you need for one can actually make the other worse. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So imagine that you have a team, you're a PI or you manage a team at work, and you've noticed that at your team meetings, the um, women tend to get interrupted more than the men do. And this would be a classic differential treatment finding, one that has empirical support um, at job engineering job talks. Uh, Mary Blair Loy and 
her colleagues actually went and coded how often women get interrupted and women tend to get interrupted in their job talks significantly more than men do with consequences for finishing their talks. So if you observe this on your team, it would um, you know, be in line with what the data show this, uh, this differential treatment of women. So you decide to do something about it and you decide to start keeping track and you count and every time that a woman gets interrupted, you decide to interrupt a man as well. And after doing this for a few times, you have now produced equality of interruption. You have eliminated differential treatment. Women and men on your team are now getting interrupted at the same rates. Have you eliminated gender bias and discrimination? Um, our theory would argue no, that you might have eliminated differential treatment, but in doing so, you might have actually created another form of bias, a masculine default, where interruption is seen as the right way, the valued way um, to uh, be heard, the, um, you're modeling it as a leader, and it becomes the, the kind of norms or you know, the way people interact with each other in this environment. And um, women are less likely to be socialized to intrusively interrupt others and more likely to encounter uh, backlash when they do. So this would be a more difficult environment for women to be heard in and to speak up in um, when you have this kind of culture of interruption. Uh, so there's lots of examples of masculine defaults that we pull together in this paper, um, examples that have empirical support. I'm just gonna list out a few. You can go to the paper, it's on my website, um, and you can see all the examples if you'd like. Um, this is just some examples from a table, but things like you know having a very combative adversarial environment, um, holding meetings after work hours, having cutthroat and competitive environments, um, uh, having masculine wording in job ads, et cetera, et cetera. The reason I put this table up is because I just wanna to point to one line here, which is um, something that we were just talking about, about stereotypes of what it means to be a computer scientist. And uh, this is work that um, I did as a graduate student and as an assistant professor, looking at how computer scientists are stereotyped in the US and how that might communicate a lower sense of belonging to women and girls. Um, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about these kinds of stereotypes. So these are pictures from two popular television shows, Big Bang Theory and Silicon Valley. And um, it's always amazing to me to put these cast side by side. So they're both, um, they're physicists and computer scientists and engineers. Um, they look like they're the same cast, but they are different casts, but it just shows you how narrow this stereotype is that circulates in our media and also in the minds of our students as we've established with empirical work. Um, and, uh, you know, this stereotype that you, um, you know, you're male, you're white, maybe Asian, um, you uh, are kind of socially awkward and um, love science fiction, and you've been coding since you were a little kid. Um, all of these kind of stereotypes are highly exaggerated and often inaccurate of computer scientists and engineers, but this is the image that a lot of students have in their heads of what it means to be a computer scientist and engineer. And when you make this image salient, as we have done through the environments, the computer science classrooms and tech companies and what they display in their environments, or um, through role models who fit these stereotypes or through media representations like this, what you end up seeing is that women express less interest in computer science and engineering than men do. But if you can change these stereotypes and you give women a different image, you show them a different media portrayal, um, you show them a classroom or a tech company that doesn't fit this image and is a more kind of neutral professional image, um, uh, or you show them examples of a role model who, who has interests that are more than just sci-fi and playing video games, uh, women's interest can increase and um, we are able to draw more women into the field. Um, now, one of the things that I, you know, had always thought about with this work that uh, led me to think about to, you know, writing the masculine defaults paper was, um, I never could put my finger on whether this was gender bias or not. Um, you know, there, there was no mistreatment happening with these uh, images of, or stereotypes of computer scientists. There was no, you know, these, uh, you know, Star Trek posters were not harassing any women and um, there was no judgment of women being less competent or anything like that in a lot of these television shows. Uh, but what it's doing is it's signaling uh, who belongs in these fields. It's signaling who can be successful and who belongs. And that image is a very male oriented one. And um, 
you know, therefore we, we qualify it, we classify it as a masculine default. It's something that seems to uh, the normal or the standard thing to do in these fields, the thing that's rewarded, the things that, that's successful is to be someone like this in computer science and engineering. And if you deviate from this, then um, the message, implicit message is that you won't be successful and you maybe shouldn't be in the field. Um, so we classify this as, as an example of a masculine default. Um, okay, I see there's a couple of comments in chat. Let me, uh, actually, I can't find my mouse. So if anybody wants to say anything right now, I'm happy to take, uh, wait, I think I can find my mouse. No, I can't. Okay, sorry. Um, does anybody want, want to interrupt me and say something? That's totally fine. No, okay, I'm gonna keep I'll going. Just, I'll, just, I'll just throw out one comment there. Interestingly yes. enough, you know, you had a picture of the Big Bang Theory there, but none of those individuals are computer scientists in the Big Bang. There's one engineer and three physicists. And yes. of course, in Big Bang, you have two women who also have their PhDs. Their yes, but they are biologists. So isn't that interesting? So they, yes. they put the women in the field where women already are represented yep. very well. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, Silicon Valley is computer scientists and Big Bang Theory is physicists and engineers. That's correct. Yeah, and it's always made me mad that they put the women in biology. Um, if I'm like, if you're gonna have women, <laughs> Um, at least show some role models. But anyway, um, but yes, that's correct. Any other thoughts or comments, questions? Okay, let's talk about, um, let's talk, oh, we're almost out of time too. Okay, so let me rush ahead here and just talk about um, uh, how to get rid of masculine defaults and then um, I will close. So um, first step is, uh, Okay, sorry, find my mouse again. Um, first step is to identify them. And we've talked about uh, some examples of how to do that. And then there's really two options. One is to dismantle them. So to try to replace them with something else. And the other one is to balance them out. And the example I was gonna tell you about, but I will just briefly mention is Harvey Mudd that did a really good job of dismantling a masculine default they had in their environment. Um, they massively increased the proportion of women getting degrees in computer science. And one of the things they noticed is that their department had a masculine default, they, they valued and they rewarded students with prior programming experience. So students were more likely to be seen as good students and more likely to graduate. And so one of the things they did, oh, and this is a masculine default because boys are more likely to have prior programming experience than girls are um, in high schools. So one of the things they did is they created two classes. One class was just for students who did not have prior programming experience. And they set up these classes very carefully. You can read um, the paper that we wrote and many other papers that have, uh, and articles that like um, journalistic pieces that have talked about this, but um, they set it up in such a way that it wasn't seen as being worse to not have prior programming experience. And it communicated to students that even if they didn't have prior programming experience, there's still a place for them in this university. They can still be a great computer scientist. And many of these students went on to stay in the major and they were able to um, actually achieve parity uh, in, in uh, computer science degrees at Harvey Mudd. Um, so let me close by saying that in my work, I'm really interested in shifting explanations for disparities um, away from individuals, as we talked about before. So not putting blame on girls or women for um, not being interested or not being good at these fields, but really thinking about what these fields can do and broader um, society as well to try to make changes to make these fields more welcoming. And I'm, I'm also particularly interested in identifying forms of bias that may be harder to see or hidden, but may have very powerful effects. And um, I try to think about um, not only how to identify these problems, but how to design effective remedies so that we can um, create a more welcoming environment um, for women and uh, everybody else in fields like computer science and engineering. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I, you can tell me if you want me to take a question or if uh, we should just close out, David, whatever you prefer. Yeah, um, so thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, thank you for the uh, questions. Um, uh, and um, of course, if people need to leave, that's understandable. Um, I guess I did wanna ask one question, Sumna. You have the ear of deans, administrators, maybe department chairs here, and the ear of lots of faculty who run large introductory courses. Um, and so what, what do you want people to focus on? What are, what are steps that people who can make important decisions can start taking um, uh, soon? 
Um, and and where, should, where, or where should people be looking for ideas and advice? Yeah, that's a really big question. I will just say a couple things. Um, first of all, you, um, I would say doing some diagnosing is really important. So um, where are the bottlenecks? Like where is the, you know, is it that um, there's a lot of, you know, women in the intro class and then they fall off over time, uh, which I think would be, you know, that would be different than the national pattern where it's like, well, the women um, sometimes aren't even taking the intro class, but, you know, depending on what's going on in your own environments, doing diagnosing that way. And then, of course, not only focusing on um, undergrads, but focusing on what's happening in graduate school, how are, uh, what are the ways that you decide who's a good student and do those are there masculine defaults involved in that? Um, also thinking about how you do faculty hiring. I'll just give you one example. In our department, um, you know, we, uh, I was on a search committee, a couple actually, and we um, decided to actually elevate what we would term some as some feminine defaults in our search criteria because we recognize that we had a lot of masculine defaults in our search criteria, for example, the job talk. Um, so we saw the job talk as a place where uh, sometimes, you know, competence and confidence are conflated. There's actually work by Cameron Anderson showing that when people see confidence, they often assume competence, but really they should probably be making the opposite, um, drawing the opposite conclusion. Um, and job talks are really a place where, you know, people, men can be very confident, take up a lot of space and, and, um, and as we mentioned before, there's interruption differences, things like that. So we um, we couldn't get rid of the job talk, uh, but what we could do is decrease the weight of the job talk to nothing <laughs> in our among our committee. We couldn't help what the other faculty were doing, although we did try to educate them. But then we also elevated things to balance out the job talk, things like um, we started doing mentorship checks. So we started calling um, people students or former, you know, honor students or to figure out how they were as a mentor. Um, and we, you know, so we and we started um, thinking about service and things like that as well. So anyway, so those are things that, um, you know, concrete examples of once you've identified that you have these defaults in your environment, how to counteract them. Um, there's so many other things I could say, but you're welcome to email me and I can give you specifics. Like I have ideas about how to change the image of computer science and things like that as well. But um, I also don't wanna keep you all too long. Um, so I'll, I'll just end with um, auditing, getting numbers, um, trying to either uh, dismantle systems that are inequitable or balance them out and then get the numbers again, see if it actually made a difference. Um, David, I see one more hand. Oh, I see a couple more hands. I, yeah, I'm happy to stay. Uh, I, yeah, I just, I don't want to, I don't know what, yeah, you tell me whatever you want me to do. Yeah, we can say and people feel free to leave, but let's, uh, we have you. So let, if people have questions, then it'd yes, be great I do. This is where I learn and this is where I get ideas. So, um, yeah, any ideas for things that you would like to see tested is also very helpful. Yeah. So we have, wait, is Shelly's hand up? Yes, yeah, so thanks. This was a great talk, although I must say these talks make me so angry every time <laughs> because, you know, things are not changing as fast as they should. But in, in my discussions with people in computer science here, the biggest problem I've seen with admissions is that this is a limited resource, that uh, they are making choices about who is admitted to that major. And much of the the at least from a couple of years ago, much of the decision was based on, were you part of a computer science club in high school? Yeah. Uh, did you show interest in these? Did you enter contests that involved computing? And so, you know, it's the, well, the women just aren't that interested or they would be doing all of these things in high school. So we admit fewer women to the major. And then in talking with students who were majoring in computer science, uh, they felt there was differential treatment, not only from the faculty, but from their fellow students. Yeah. And that concept that they just weren't as good and not as interested in computer science. So I think the first thing we have to do is really tackle the admissions process and make this a much more open process. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think I'm hoping that this masculine defaults language will allow people, because it's hard to say, oh, um, they need to have computer science. It's hard to say that's a form of bias if you don't have this concept, because it seems like, oh, but it's just the same, it's the same criteria. We're applying it equally to everybody, you know? And, and I know that um, admissions committees are all about criteria now, which is super important. I mean, that's a step forward from the old days where you didn't have criteria and you just pick like your 
you know, who went to your high school or whatever. Um, uh, so that's a step forward. But the problem is that nobody's like interrogating the criteria to see whether they're fair. Um, so I'm hoping that this language will help uh, somewhat. But um, but yes, you're right. Uh, you know, I think breaking down that um, that idea that uh, you know, you have to have experience, and if you don't have experience, you're not interested. Um, is really important as a step one to diversifying the undergrad programs, mm -hmm. as Harvey Mudd did. They did a really great job of that. Um, let's see. I want to let Kyle Dobson go next because he hasn't asked a question yet. Yep. Oh, geez, dude. Okay. Um, sorry, I was, I was hoping to get a little bit extra time to formulate my questions. Out. All right. Um, so. Uh, basically, I was thinking about this all in terms of fit, kind of with like the Tony Schmader, uh, Constantine Sedekides, um model of what, how people can, um, you know, kind of see themselves fitting in particular um, contexts versus not. And I was really trying to broaden this thinking about, um, you know, what about the women who don't feel like they fit a lot of the feminine qualities and they actually like the masculine defaults and you're of course gonna run into that problem with just about any other combination. And I know you were saying what you were saying about gender um, for a reason because you were trying to account for that. Um, but I was just kind of thinking about um, uh, almost the eradication of defaults in general and almost mm -hmm. the idea that organizations or um, and the people they're inviting into them should kind of work together to find fit instead and think about that more as a process rather than saying like, here's a list of what the qualities of a computer science person are. They're both ma masculine and feminine qualities. It's, there's parity, but instead saying, well, I don't know, like, what are you? Are you good at just doing computer science? That's really all you have to do. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and uh, yeah, and I I didn't do my usual caveat, which I should have done, which is you know the first time I gave a talk on this work when I was a graduate student outside of my department and and outside of the university was when I went to Google, and um, and I remember the second question I got was from a woman engineer and she said, but I love those stereotypes. Like that's what got me into the field. Like I love Star Trek. And so I, I've since then always done this kind of, and I forgot to do it today. So thank you for this opportunity to do it, which is that um, we always see a core group of women who do relate to those stereotypes. And like you're saying, probably, um, you know, all a different group of women or the same group of women, um, you know, who also, uh, you know, enjoy the kind of more stereotypically masculine environments. Um, just like we always see a core group of men who probably would have gone into the field if these stereotypes did not exist, they don't relate to those stereotypes. And so um, my, my goal is never to, um, you know, just replace one set of stereotypes with another, but it's really to broaden who can be, so like a lot of different people can see themselves in this field. And then what I like to think about is actually medicine. Um, and, you know, medicine also has a stereotype. Um, and so if I said, imagine a doctor, you might have a some image in your mind. But then if I said, imagine another doctor who doesn't look like that first doctor, my guess is that you could readily call to mind another doctor who doesn't look, and then a third one. And part of that might be because, you know, Grey's Anatomy, ER, like all these shows, they did a good job of portraying different types of doctors who look different from each other. But if I say like, imagine a computer scientist, I mean, those of you in computer science could probably do this, but many students who are not in computer science, you know, imagine computer scientists, they think like Bill Gates. Well, I don't know if they still think Bill Gates, but that's what my generation would have thought. Um, and then imagine another computer scientist and then they're thinking like uh, Elon Musk and then another one, okay, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, and so it's all, it's kind of the same person over and over. Um, and so that's, that's really the goal. It's to diversify so that there, there's multiple ways to be and you still feel like you belong in that field. Um, so yes, I really appreciate that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Greg, I think you're up. Okay, no, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the talk. Um, I just have two anecdotal kind of pieces of or stories uh, from my background, if I could, and just ask, and then ask you, what are we gonna do about it? Um, I don't know if you know about, have ever heard of the Cyber Patriot Cybersecurity Competition? Mm -mm. It's, it's the largest cybersecurity competition in the world. It's for middle school and high school students. Okay. Um, a few years ago, when we had our first middle school, the first middle school teams competing, uh, one of the three middle school teams that made it to the national championship was an all-girl team. Uh, 
And I was one of the judges at the competition that year. And it was really kind of interesting because I kept hearing throughout the competition this giggling going on. And we'd look over at the girls team and they were just having a great time. They were competent. They were interested in the subject and they were having fun at this national championship. So, you know, I don't know what that means in terms of are competitions a good way to get people interested or not, but at least at the middle school, it seemed to be working. And then they get to the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and we work, one of the school districts that we work very closely with in Cyber Patriot is the LA Unified School District, which I think is the second largest uh, school district in the country. And they didn't, they never published a paper on this, but I was talking to some of the folks out there about the challenges that they faced in terms of getting uh, young women involved in security in the high school. And the individual who was uh, talking about his experience and talking to the girls and going out there and, and doing surveys and things said there were two major, they could basically lump things into two different, two statements in essence uh, that caused problems with them trying to get the girls involved. One of them was the thought that um, smart girls aren't pretty. And the second one was, you can't be smarter than your boyfriend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these two factors were impacting their ability to get girls interested in cybersecurity in particular, but also just STEM in general. And I don't know how to go about battling that. And they didn't. They were, they were coming up with, you know, trying to come up with ways to battle it, but they weren't being very successful. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts or ideas or something. I mean, and obviously nobody in the program believed those two. Right, right. So yeah. These, but this is what they, this is what they were facing trying to get young girls involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I guess I'd be curious, are the girls in those schools also not going into medicine and uh math and other fields you know because um smart I, well yeah i guess it's kind of complicated but like you know you see like med, med schools are now 50 50 law schools you know also 50 percent women and so um but having said that i will say that i do have a paper on something that we call double isolation which is um related to computer science which is that um, we show that women feel that they'll not only be isolated within the field if they enter it, but they will be isolated from their peers if they enter it. So people not in computer science. Um, so I, I think that's I, I think that's right in the sense that um, because of these strong stereotypes in computer science, that um, women feel like if they go into these fields, they will not only lose you know, maybe some of their friends that they have now, but then they won't really make friends in these fields. So I think that is a problem. And I, to me, it relates to this, to these stereotypes. So if we can change these stereotypes and to get people, you know, to like, as Kyle was saying, kind of come up with a more diverse set of people who can be in these fields, then women won't feel like, oh, if I enter this, then people are going to judge me negatively. And then, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to um, find a field where I, I will be able to make friends in, or I won't be marginalized or isolated. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think for me it comes back to stereotype change. I think a more it, like a more um, maybe practical solution, it, and one of, that I've heard from computer science teachers in high school, is uh, recruiting girls in groups. Um, so that way they have their peer group and they can stick with their peer group. And it sounds like kind of the the team that you were talking about, the middle schoolers, like they they probably had a strong sense of belonging to their group and they really liked each other, and that's probably what kept them in and made them successful. And so I've heard of computer science teachers because computer science is optional in so many um, places, they, you know, the good teachers will go out and actually try to recruit girls to take their class and they'll do it in groups. They'll, they'll get girls and their friends to take the class together. And that then gives them this kind of social buffer also increases the number of girls in the class. Um, so that could be, um, I mean, I don't know if you're looking for a, a concrete strategy, but uh, if your friends are looking for like a concrete strategy, then um, trying to get people to do it together as opposed to recruiting girls one by one can hopefully help alleviate some of those social concerns. Well, and take a look at back to your Big Bang Theory, the two women with the PhDs, mm -hmm. um, they don't allow them to be you know, gorgeous on the show or something. I mean, you take yeah. a look at Amy Farafella on the show yeah. and then you take a look at the actress, two different looks, two yeah. completely different looks. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're totally playing into that idea that if you are in these, if you are in these science fields then you have to be like a nerd and um, yeah. And they, and um, right. They're not, they're not promoting the idea that you can, um, you know, have feminine interests and qualities and also be good at science, which is of course something that is very possible yeah. and common, but is not the common image out there. Which is not helping the situation. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, what it speaks to is that we're a lot of times we're talking about like 15 year olds and like talk about stereotypes. The stereotype is not that they make the best decisions based on the best information. Now they don't always make bad decisions. They have good gut instincts a lot of times, but um, you know, these the problems are complex when we're talking about um, the, the, uh, emerging adult humans who have lots of criteria for making decisions, some of which are like, does this make me a nerd or not? Mm-hmm. You know, um, and so it's something that high school teachers contend with. And um, you know, it's another whole interesting angle to all these things. Um, we are out of time, but I want to just thank everybody for this. And Sapna, you know, uh, you could have given 10 talks on all this work. Um, and, uh, but the most important thing is you gave us as a really diverse audience of people in, in natural science, in administrations, in humanities, in behavioral science, of kind of shared vocabulary and shared evidence base for beginning to think about these issues. So more than anything, thank you for just empowering us as an institution to get smarter and to try to innovate. Um, and we'd love to stay in touch. We hope that uh, people can uh, talk to you again in the future. You have made lots of fans of us, so we'll be following your work going forward. Um, and you are always welcome back, um, especially to see the talks. And I will put in a plug for those of us still on the line. We have actually a pretty amazing group of talks the rest of the semester. And I think our next one, uh, either February or March, is an uh, amazing physicist named Kayvon Stassen, who's personally responsible for a lot of um, racial and ethnic diversity in physics and astrophysics. And so I'm very excited for his talk as well. Um, I just I just put the link for the schedule in, yeah. in the chat. We do have one coming up on February 9th. with Dr. Amanda Diekman from University oh, of yeah. um, and then um, well. And then uh, Dr. Kayvon Stassen is talking in March yeah. 9th. So... So if you're a fan of a fan of Subna, you'll be a fan of Amanda Deakman as well. Yeah, her work is very related. Yeah. Yeah. We're citing each other all the time. So um yeah, thank you so much. Um, great questions, really engaged audience. I I um, really appreciate it. And well, you're welcome to reach out to me if you have further things you want to talk about. And thank you, David. Fabulous. Always being thank so you, nice. Subna. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Take care. Bye. Um, yeah, I saw I saw your message, so I can stick around for a minute. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you real quick. First of all, that was an amazing talk. Great oh, questions. Um, I really it was very engaging. Um, one, I had emailed you um, a couple weeks back about kind of some extra meetings. Um, and oh, I totally forgot to respond to that. I'm sorry. No, 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 no you you did. You did. Oh, you okay. you gave me time. I, I I didn't put anything on your calendar. Oh, okay, now, okay, okay. Good. What I wanted to do is I wanted to check real quick and see if you still have um, time tomorrow. What I was going to do is hopefully. Um, we have a um, TXMI faculty fellowship. So we have 14 faculty this year and we have eight faculty from last year, the first year of the fellowship. Um, mm-hmm. I was gonna just grab an hour and see if anyone could join and just have kind of an informal chat. Um, I thought that'd be really good. So yeah. um, I was thinking uh, tomorrow at um, 3 p.m. Central, so 1 p.m. your time. Uh, I have a meeting till 1.30. We're on the weird half hour thing here. Ah, okay. So our classes all start on the half hour. So I could do 1.30 to 2.30. Yeah, that, that, that could work. So okay. uh, that'd be uh, 3.30 to 4.30 our time. That, that'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Okay, I will send out the invitation and I'll, I'll, I'll copy you on it. It has the Zoom link there. Um, okay, and are, were any of them here or are they going to be like a new? 
No, no, so a lot of them were here. Um, okay. they, they, were all, they were all invited. Um, uh, the woman who, um, she asked a question. She was um, a physics professor, yeah. uh, Dr. Christina Marker. She was one of yeah. the first ones. She She's invited. She, she was one of our fellows last year. Okay. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of them were here. So. Okay, okay, great, yeah. yeah. Okay, Would awesome. Well, I, so I just wanted to make sure you were available before I sent that out. Yeah, so. good thinking, because I <laughs> I wasn't, so. Um, okay. Yeah, but I will be at 1.30, so that's okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. All, okay. Right. All right, take care, bye. Right. Thanks, Sapna. Yes, take care.